Good evening. I'm Meg Mott, and I'm pleased to be a part of this Vermont PBS program on the 19th Amendment. Since I retired from Marlboro College, I've been going around the Northeast to talk about the various amendments to the U.S. Constitution, uh, particularly the Bill of Rights, but also the Reconstruction Amendments and the 19th Amendment. And what I like most about talking about the Constitution and the amendments is that usually we don't agree. That's the thing you can say about the United States is that the Constitution allows us to disagree with each other and to come up with different interpretations. That may be less true of the 19th Amendment than some of our other amendments, but um, happily tonight, we are joined by two other people who I thought would bring a lot to our discussion of the 19th Amendment and would be able to bring uh, nuances to uh, how we think about women's suffrage. But before we turn to uh, Elizabeth and our panelists, and she will introduce the panelists, I wanted to just quickly go over the language of the 19th Amendment. It is that it does not give women the vote, which is oftentimes how people talk about this particular amendment. What it actually says is the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. It's pretty much the same language as was used in the 15th Amendment when African Americans or when the um, vote was um, extended or that states could not deny or abridge the vote on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So they use that exact same language, but um, they introduced sex in 1920. As you saw in that previous segment, many people tried to get sex in on the 15th Amendment but that wasn't successful. And it's one of the things that we may talk about um, and feel free to use your comment to ask us questions about that. The other thing about an amendment is that it's a very high bar. You can go to Article 5 in the US Constitution and you'll see that in order to change the Constitution, you need two thirds of both houses of Congress to agree on the language and then it gets ratified by the states. With the 19th Amendment, it required 36 states to ratify. Now, it started with Wisconsin and it ended with Tennessee, who uh, ratified the amendment on August 18th, 1920. So August 18th is the actual day that the 19th Amendment, we should celebrate its birthday. But um, not all the states, perhaps where you're from, ratified the 19th Amendment. So if you're from Massachusetts or New Hampshire or Maine or Rhode Island, you should pat yourselves on the back because these were the states that ratified the 19th Amendment. If you're from Vermont or Connecticut, you're a little late. It got passed and yes, uh, and one of our panelists who has uh, a lot, uh, has done a lot of research on electoral politics will be able to talk about how when a certain party begins to understand that the movement is going in a certain direction, all of a sudden that party wants to be behind suffrage expansion. So that's a little bit of the history behind the 19th Amendment. First it was slow and then it started to build. Um, but let me turn it over to Elizabeth Hewitt, who's going to introduce our other panelists, and then we can get to some interesting discussion and I hope debate about what the 19th Amendment was and is and can be. Good evening. Um, as Meg mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Hewitt. I'm the Sunday editor for vtdigger.org and I will be your host for this evening. Um, so let me introduce you to our panelists. Um, we have joining us this evening is Amal Ahmed. She is professor, uh, associate professor of political science and associate provost for equity and inclusion at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And we're also joined by John T. Grayson, who is professor emeritus of religion at Mount Holyoke College. And he's currently working on an intellectual biography on the women who shaped the mind of Frederick Douglas. And we also previously heard, already heard from Meg Mott. She's Professor Emeritus of Politics at Marlborough College and also Town Moderator of Putney. 
Um, so thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, for our audience, if you have any questions or comment that you would like to share, um, you can do so through the uh, chat function, which is on the right side of your screen. And please include your name um, with anything that you send in to us. Um, so I'm going to start with you, John. Why did Frederick Douglass stand so strongly for women's suffrage? He argued at Seneca Falls that by denying women the vote, the country was repudiating, quote, one half of the moral and intellectual power of government. So what did those terms mean at the time? Well, it's a, hello. It's a good way to, to begin because Frederick Douglass recognized very early on that um, that the words, the moral and intellectual power of the government was very, very uh, important, that women were human beings. And that was one way of codifying their humanity, their citizenship, and uh, therefore their right to vote. Now, not everybody in America had that experience. Uh, and in many ways, the American experience um, reflects some of the um, ancient history I've studied with regard to Greece, to the extent that women and children were granted uh, the right of being called citizens, but men uh, were the only ones who could vote. And so what you have in ancient Greece, in the fifth century BC, you have it uh, duplicated or repeated in the American experience in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, Douglas, by using this phrase, one half of the moral and intellectual power of government was essentially arguing that women had to be given the right to vote. Actually, I am shocked and surprised that it hadn't happened long before the time it occurred uh, because the women who were uh, pressing for the vote were the wives, the mothers, the sisters, the daughters of the very men who were making decisions about this young country, the United States. Um, in contrast to the experience of African Americans in this country, we had no connection in any direct way to the decision makers. And so that women uh, were delayed for such a long period was very, very surprising to, to me. But Douglas pressed on because he recognized the plight of women in America um, was co-joined co with the plight of blacks in America. And and Meg, initially Lucretia Mott was against women's suffrage. She and Frederick Douglass uh, were at odds on this point. So how did her rejection of political action fit into her theory of non-resistance? Hmm. Um, so Lucretia Mott was, she was not, she, the way she would frame it is, it's not that I will not endorse women uh, capacity for voting, it's that when you're voting, let's be clear, uh, like William Garrison, uh, she felt that the system was very corrupt. So if you're going to, one of the lines she has in, in one of her speeches, if we vote, what are our choices? We have warriors or we have slave owners. So to participate in the political process for her um, was not an unalloyed good. It was always going to be um, substandard. And and there's some interesting pieces there where you, the line that's oftentimes quoted is she says to Elizabeth Cady Stanton when she says women should have the suffrage at Seneca Falls, Lucretia Mott says, Lizzie, you make us look ridiculous. Or the, she's Quaker, the makes us look ridiculous. And um, 
And there's a way of reading that of that she didn't care about politics or that she was so otherworldly with her Quaker thinking. Uh, but she actually, she was once one of those um, Quakers who followed Elias Hicks. And he had this idea that you had to have a higher moral platform. And that's what you judged how politics was. Uh, the Quakers also, these Hicksite Quakers, also thought that everybody had inside of them an inner light, and therefore we, men and women had to be equal. Because if each person had within them this inner light, and that inner light spoke to them about what was just, and told them what to, how to be merciful, then clearly um, women and men were exact same thing. The problem was the politics, according to Lucretia Mott, was so corrupt to engage in it, how could you engage and not reinforce? And sort of the party options was problematic at that time for her too. But she never said, don't go for the vote, but don't expect the vote to do what needs to be done in order to change this very corrupt situation we had. So Amel, I wanna to go to you now. The, this segment really focuses on race and gender, but class was clearly an issue as well. So how did party leaders working to exclude a labor party from gaining traction in the United States encourage women's suffrage? So I think first, uh, you know, to me, it's clear that class was all over the movement and, and its interactions with other movements. Uh, you could see it even in how the, the arguments for women's suffrage were articulated, which in the early movement were very much elite it was an elite movement. Um, and the arguments used were the arguments that had been used previously by, by those who were pushing for uh, manhood suffrage. And they were elite not in the sense that they were uh, based in, in material wealth, but the arguments really focused on, you know, we are educated, we are cultured, we are enlightened, we have all of these, uh, you know, attributes that make us capable of governing and should give us a stake in our own fates. And that should be the reason that you extend us the franchise. Um, you also, you know, in, in that clip, it was obvious in, 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 the, in the conflict that um, when the vote was, was, was extended to free slave men and not women, it became kind of a, a um, it, it was a very strong resentment that those who were more educated would not receive the franchise. So I think the early movement was very much an elite movement and it was based on a certain kind of class politics that was very familiar in the United States. Um, now, interesting, you brought up parties because, of course, they're, they're the ones who are um, the, the ultimate arbiters in, in these decisions. And where you see the movement really turning a corner, you know, the later movement really turning a corner is when they start forging cross-class alliances. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, works in a kind of counterintuitive way. They start reaching out to working class women. So these really elite women start w reaching out to working class women to bring them into the movement. And what that ultimately does is it poses a challenge to the labor movement because the labor movement at the time is also very interested in recruiting women and, and ideologically they're very interested in, in promoting women's suffrage. Um, and the labor movement poses a threat to both of the dominant parties at the time. And so again, very similar, strong similarities to manhood suffrage where the vote is extended as a way of taming the, the labor movement, or it's one of the, um, strategic benefits in, in the view of parties, that it becomes a way, you know, these cross-class alliances that are being forged uh, between women um, take some, a lot of the steam out of the nascent labor movement at the time. So we have a question um, submission to sort of everybody, anybody who wants to hop in. Why a century after universal white American women's suffrage have women been nominated and have um, so few uh, women been nominated and elected? Mm. That's a great question. Well, I was just thinking about the difference between the 15th Amendment and the 19th Amendment. After the 15th Amendment passes in Reconstruction, before the terror is rained down upon uh, some of those Southern states through the Ku Klux Klan and other mechanisms, uh, there were about 14 or 15 African-American men, freed men who served in Congress. And we didn't see anything like that similar with the 19th amendment. It takes a long time. There, in fact, there was a, a woman from Montana who had already served in the Senate because Montana had the vote. 
prior to the 19th Amendment. And, and as I'm trying to make sense of this, like why is it that women didn't jump in? Well, I think it has a lot to do with the family unit. There was, uh, the family unit understood itself as um, we work together to figure out what's in our family's best interest. And trying to even give women the vote was considered, as we saw in, in, in the clip, there's a lot, and we'll see in the next clip, there's a lot of pushback, like what's gonna happen to mothers and wives if they start voting? And I, and I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I haven't done enough research. Somebody else should maybe jump in is, is why is it that that family unit then seemed to reinforce itself for a long time? And it's only fairly recently that we're seeing a big uptick in women running for office. Another I'm, thing I'd like to, I'd like to say something on that. Um, my background in, uh, American religion uh, suggests to me that, especially in the 19th century, along with the pseudoscience of phrenology, mm. there was also uh, a dependence on uh, biblical scripture to ratify the patriarchy. And uh, this notion of, uh, of a patriarchal society, though the Hebrew Bible is essentially talking about a theocracy, but nevertheless, uh, in many practical ways, the world of the ancient Jews was um, a patriarchy. Uh, the lines of and generations of leaders in the Hebrew and Jewish community were defined by their links to the father. And it was only later that the links to the mother occurred, much later. And um, so this whole patriarchal uh, reliance certainly comes from, it was reinforced and supported by religious ideology and religious teaching. And thus you had the idea that the man was the head of the home. And I use that phrase not only because it occurs in some of the literature, in much of the literature, but um, the idea that the head is where the reason resides. And uh, that was a very, very strong uh, force for supporting this resistance to having women um, being understood as equals. And I, I certainly don't justify it, but I, it, it, hep, it, it also parallels some of the biblical um, illusions and texts that have justified um, looking at people whose histories involve slavery as lesser than others. So the resistance to having a woman, I mean, letting women vote and taking 100 years for me is not very surprising, not because it should have been 100 years, but because this um, patriarchal view has been embedded in our culture from the very beginning. Amelda, do you wanna hop in? I would just uh, add quickly that uh, you know, we know that there are fewer women candidates, um, but even controlling for that, there the success rate of women is is much lower. Um, and you know, I think just to echo some of the points that have been made, it does seem like a hundred years you should have seen more progress, but the time of it doesn't matter if you're not tackling what is actually problematic, which is these patriarchal tropes that we know continue to influence thinking. I would also say that you know the fight for the vote was between men and women. The, the, the fight for representation and, and, and leadership in democracy, that's between everyone. You know, the, so it's the fact that women aren't getting elected means that women aren't voting for them. 
Um, and we all know that the, you know, the research on bias tells us that uh, leadership is associated with male type traits and women are penalized for displaying the same male type traits when, when, when they go for positions of leadership. So I think the, the issues are much deep, they're not institutional or, or structural necessarily, um, but they get to the heart of these uh, cultural biases that we know are still rampant. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from Nikki. Uh, black women are left out of women's suffrage history for the most part. So wasn't it the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that truly helps black women get the full voting right? Yes. Uh, the role of black women in American history is, uh, is a disturbing one. That is to say, uh, America has held black women down for an incredible time. And for this, in this respect, uh, I have to say that uh, the survival of the community, the black community is dependent on the black woman. But at the same time, they were used and abused um, throughout um, not just the last two centuries, but uh, ever since slavery came to America. So black women were the example of the struggle of the black community itself in the sense that while everyone was talking about, how do I know that I'm human? I think therefore I am. In the black community, the question was, how do I prove that I'm human? And many black um, uh, persons were arguing that, how do I prove that I'm human and I don't know my mother because of the separation between um, the families that occurred in slavery and then also occurs at post slavery. So that that uh, the black woman has had an enormous uh, hurdle to overcome, but I have to say I'm pleased to see the way uh, they've re they've come now to represent the community in many political areas as well as economic areas and um, academic areas. So you have perhaps the rebound effect. Uh, so another another submission submission here. Uh, what was the stance of the president at the time of the Nineteenth Amendment, and how did he support or prevent the passing of the amendment? Mm. Right. So President Wilson um, was it was wartime. President Wilson had Woodrow Wilson, who's now getting a fair amount of attention. Um, because um, of his, uh, probably the most egregious thing that he did is pretty soon after he got into office, he showed Birth of a Nation, and, which is a, um, a film that uh, supports the idea of the South, the lost cause, uh, white supremacy. So, so this is sort of the backdrop to Wilson's presidency that people are, I think, spending more attention thinking about now. Uh, but he had also been the, the president for democracy, went to World War uh, I in, to preserve democracy. So he was using a lot of democratic rhetoric, democracy rhetoric, and uh, suffragists said, hey, uh, democracy, we got a problem here in the United States. Half the voting age cannot vote because uh, women cannot vote. And... Um, he was against it, and, and this is one of those end game politics when it started to get going, and all of a sudden it looked like this was going to actually happen this time. And women, I think we'll see in the next segment, are doing a whole lot more in terms of uh, war support in factories. So, it again, it's militarism that opens the franchise. That's one of those things they say. So, I don't know that's a little piece. Amel, I don't know, you want to add something? No. Um, and just very briefly, Meg, we had one question for you. Are you any relation to Lucretia Mott? Uh, 
Well, my wife, great, 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 great. I don't know. We go up a bit and then we see, we go over one. So it's a great, 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 great aunt. Uh, so yes, there is a family connection. When we went to Seneca Falls, Allison stood next to the statue. We looked at the noses. We could see a family resemblance. Thank you. So this is, um, we're going to take another look at an, a clip. Um, we are going to return afterwards with more discussion. We hope you enjoyed that last segment. Uh, welcome back. Um, again, I'm Elizabeth Hewitt. I'm the Sunday editor for vtdigger.org and I'm your host this evening. I'll reintroduce our panel real quick. Um, we have Meg Mott joining us. She's Professor Emeritus of Politics at Marlboro College. She's also the town moderator of Putney. Amal Ahmed is Associate Professor of Political Science and Associate Provost for Equity and Inclusion at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And John T. Grayson is Professor Emeritus of Religion at Mount Holyoke College, and he's currently working on an intellectual biography of the woman who shaped the mind of Frederick Douglass. Um, so I'll turn back to our panelists for more discussion now. Um, let's, let's bring us uh, sort of to the current moment. How did the social movements that we've seen lately, including the recent widespread racial justice protests and the Me Too movement, connect to the history that we're discussing this evening? Well, um, I can jump in on this. It's um, one of the pieces that I've been thinking about, particularly in, in putting together Me Too with Black Lives Matter. I mean, just that could be, and we saw it, especially in that first clip, how sometimes elite white women were thinking about their own concerns and were not aware of how the larger governmental system affected um, particularly African-American men um, in terms of, I don't know, uh, allegations of sexual misconduct. So I've sort of been thinking about that history and that very strong and long history of wondering what, what was going to happen? And, and I haven't fully fleshed this out, but when you have uh, Me Too, which I'm not saying that it was a predominantly white movement. I think the second um, version of Me Too was more elite uh, professional women. The first time it went through, uh, it was uh, young women of color. But in the, in the place where it got a lot of attention, I personally was starting to get worried that there was um, not much emphasis on due process or presumption of innocence. And what sometimes making allegations does when you have a criminal justice system, which doesn't have a long history of being fair. So in thinking about the past and some of the struggles um, that particularly African-American women had with, or African-American suffragists had with white suffragists, uh, Frances Harper at one point says, white women are so selfish, they can only think of themselves, and they're not thinking about the wrongs that have happened to my people. And, and I don't know, that's something where I hope those, those two movements could actually have uh, a healthy exchange. And that's what I've been thinking about. I would add uh, just, you know, a couple of things that caught my attention and, you know, reflecting on the movement and, and social movements in general uh, has been the importance of the disruptive aspects of these movements. And, I, you know, I think what it's important to note that any movement for inclusion is really a movement to change notions of peoplehood in a democracy. What does it mean to be we the people? And that is something that has to come through some, you know, significant kind of rupture. And so, you know, the beautiful thing about protests and these social movements, there's a real performative aspect to it. Um, and you saw that with the women's suffrage movement, you see it today, that it really is, you need to kind of have a, a, a jarring um, element to it because you are asking people to think things they have not thought before and to think that they're okay. So all of the, um, you know, the, Oh, there, there was talk that the giving women the vote would change how women behave. It would change um, their presence in, in different areas. And all of that was true. It did radically change women's uh, attitudes and, and behaviors. But the change, the, the disruptive aspect of it, I think, is, is what made it possible for, for that to be accepted and, and uh, you know, accommodated. 
Um, so I think for me, the, the, the broader message is that disruption is important. And if your goal is further inclusion, then you need to change how people think of we the people. My, my view here is um, that I'll only give you one glimpse. I can only give one glimpse uh, right now is I'm thinking about the uh, impact of the Aunt Jemima uh, controversy. It's not new, but it's taking on a new patina in the sense that um, the exploitation of women um, from the time of slavery through to the current period, women of color, and using them as objects to market uh, all of the ordinary artifacts of society is not uncommon. And I really welcome what we're experiencing here now. And I think that it's going to heighten the awareness, hopefully, of the consumer that uh, the, what icons are being used in order to market their wares. And so for women of color, they have been used in many, many uh, pejorative ways as marketing instruments. And uh, this really strikes me because one of my favorite books in my library is called the slave in the box, it's Aunt Jemima. And the whole idea is to help raise the consciousness of the consumer to realize that their attraction to a particular product can be, can be at the expense of someone else who has had no choice in becoming the marketing tool for that product. And we saw it with Uncle Ben's, we see it with Aunt Jemima, we see it with a whole host of things. In fact, I collect as a hobby, I collect all of this paraphernalia for advertising, uh, using people of color to market things. And it's not just an American phenomenon, it's an international phenomenon. Uh, it's Central and Latin America, it's in Europe, it's all over. Uh, and I think this is a healthy moment in which we're seeing uh, raising of consciousness. Mm. Elizabeth, can I just add one thing quickly um, to, to this point, which is that, you know, students of social movements will also tell you that they don't happen all at once. There are ebbs and flows and they come back and they layer on each other. We see that with the women's suffrage movement very clearly. And I think we're witnessing it now with Black Lives Matter. And we will be studying this moment for decades to understand how it happened that all of a sudden, you know, millions of light bulbs turned on and, and suddenly people can see structural racism where they hadn't before and understand police brutality in a way that they hadn't before. Um, but it is important to note that these movements build on previous um, episodes of, of important movements that were frustrated and um, were equally vigilant and, and, and exhausting, and that there will be waves to come beyond this moment as well. So we have a question from the audience now. Um, so can you extrapolate lessons learned from the women's fight for the right to vote that can be applied today so that we can have a woman president um, or a vice president? In essence, what clicked then that is not clicking today? Hmm. That's a great question. Anybody want to try that one? How do we get a woman president? Uh oh, <laughs> maybe we can. Uh, I think. Well, we're I see. mean, I could. I could try a little something and see other people want to jump in, and and that is. Um, I mean, I think what we we see with women's suffrage is, and and this is a point that Amel made earlier, is when they became uh, when it stopped being white elites, and there was enormous anger 
when with Elizabeth Cady Stanton when she couldn't get sex into the 15th Amendment. And, and that seemed to then turn into a, a big wedge. And I think the clips that we've seen really shows that wedge uh, in terms of white and black women feeling pretty uneasy with each other. I want to say it that way. And it was, it seemed like as things went and they became much more of a, uh, an interest in labor and a broader coalition, that that's when things started to generate. And, and maybe, I don't know, I mean, my guess, and it's, I'm a political theorist, so I can think about big ideas and not necessarily have any empirical evidence to support this. Just my brain's going, oh, that could be a possibility. But it, it does seem like if a, if a woman was able to run on a broad coalition that dealt with poverty and, and really took that as a serious problem um, and that looked at um, the amount of money that's spent on the military and wanting to redirect that for people to live healthier lives, that was, I mean, I'm a big fan of Jane Addams because she understood hey, let's have women become voters because then instead of spending all this money on war toys, which is how she described it, we could actually clean up cities so that they are uh, flourishing places for young people. Um, so that's the kind of campaign I'm still waiting to see and not just on you know, strictly gender roles or, gen or women's rights. I, I want it to be bigger than that. So I'd like to just add to that, that you know, if we compare the United States to other places in the world, we are embarrassingly behind in terms of women in leadership positions. And I think examining women in politics alone doesn't get us very far. Mm -hmm. I think any examination has to embed it in, in, in intersectional an analysis of gender, race, and class. And if you want to understand why women are not being chosen, it, it really is at the intersection of those different factors. It's why are black women not being elected? Why are working class women not being elected? Why are working class black women not being elected? And I think that is where we start really, you know, making some progress with that question. Um, but it, it is a multidimensional issue. So I'm, I'm going to stay with you for a second. We have a question here. How did women's suffrage fit into the anti-socialist forces of the early 1900s? So the anti-socialist forces of the early 1900s, just to, I guess, to give a little bit of context, um, you know, 1917 is the Russian Revolution, and that leads to the radicalization of, of workers' parties across the globe. Um, it, and... and I think beyond that, in the United States in particular, you're seeing a lot of European immigration at that time. Um, and the European immigrants who are coming tended to be on the more radical spectrum. Oftentimes they were uh, evicted from Europe for their radical activities and their participation in socialist and, and, and communist organizations. So you have a radicalization of labor that is already taking place in the United States at the same time that the women's suffrage movement is, is really gaining steam. And like I said earlier, women's, the women's suffrage movement um, had this potential uh, taming force over labor by bringing in working class women. Now, the irony of it is that the countries where socialist parties were strongest were the ones that, where women got the vote earliest. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in, in the US, you actually had um, women allying with women and undercutting a labor movement that would have potentially had uh, a socialist flavor in, in, in the early 20th century. Um, so I think they were deliberately put at odds with each other for political gain by, by the dominant parties. And Meg, one of the moral crusades that women successfully organized was the temperance movement, uh, which led to the 18th Amendment. So how did that political victory inform the uh, campaign for the 19th Amendment? Um, well, that's, that's a story that actually has some happy elements to it, because white suffragists and black suffragists understood liquor as a problem. And so there was this understanding. Um, I'm not saying that all the organizations, the temperance organizations were integrated, but at, uh, there was a, a apparatus in place where African-American women got leadership within uh, black temperance movements and then would report 
to other leaders who were white. And, and that was the beginning, I thought, of what could be a strong coalition against or, or uh, with black women and white women finding common cause around temperance. It did blow up again uh, for a variety of reasons. Another little side piece, I don't think it showed up in the clips, but some of the research I've done that both black suffragists and white suffragists use ignorance. I think John was talking about how ignorance was one of those terms that was used about um, uh, people who either drank too much or had um, um, socialist ideas, what Amel was talking about. So there were ways in which the temperance movement began something of a coalition. I think it also scared the liquor industry, which was big in Southern states. Uh, so uh, people started to get worried if women could pass temperance, because that, even though they didn't have the vote, they had the, I don't know, moral suasion, or they had the indirect influence and were able to pass the 19th Amendment. So um, they, there was an organizing ability, a focal point that, that built the coalition. We have a few more questions from the audience here that are uh, pretty interesting. So uh, after the vote, was there a higher voter turnout um, for women in urban areas compared to rural areas or did turnout change overall? I don't actually know. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. That is something I wish I had the answer to and I actually think I'm gonna go research it after we're done. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Um, so another one here is, what were the suffragettes' vision for child care and maternity leave, especially uh, since working class women were part of the movement? Mm. Amel or Do you want to jump? Well, let me jump in here. Um, the suffragettes began even when slavery was in place. Thus, um, Black women were the nannies for many of the white families. And um, as a result, there was an understandable dependence on black women to work for white families, thus freeing the uh, the mistress to do her own thing. And I, I think what that did is it, um, it really did impede the progress of black women in America. Um, one personal story I'd like to relate is uh, I grew up in a family in which my grandmother was also um, a maid in um, the home of a white family and on holidays she could not come to any of the holiday celebrations because she was obligated to spend the holiday uh, working for the family. And that has that personal experience made me has made me aware of how the um, social systems have um, are interconnected and while one benefits to a, with the social system another can be impeded or um, pre prevented from growing and developing be by virtue of be becoming an instrument of that social system anything either of you would would want to add, my grandma? Well, there was, um, for the progressives, uh, the suffragists, um, Jane Addams and other, there was a, a concern about child labor, a concern that um, people, that families had time to take care of their children. Um, so I, I, I think definitely it was on the agenda. Uh, it was, I mean, that was part of that idea that women may bring a different understanding of what government looks like and that it would be much better for families, for children, uh, and that there would be support systems so that so women didn't have to um, 
take care of somebody else's children as opposed to being with their family on a holiday. So, so um, one more for you, John. Uh, we spoke about Frederick Douglass at the beginning. Let's come back to him now. How did Frederick Douglass think about women's suffrage towards the end of his life? By then, the tides had really turned against the abolitionist suffrage coalition that we talked about earlier. Frederick Douglass was um, consistently a supporter of, of women's suffrage. Um, in this sense, he was a really um, astute um, he recognized that the shift in the attitudes uh, for um, men to be involved or blacks to be involved in the white suffragist movement was a problematic one because clearly the existential um, concern for any black suffragist person would mean that she would have to take into account her identity as a black person. And oftentimes that identity um, trumped uh, the identity of being woman because of the social circumstances in America the racial circumstances. And so um, Frederick Douglass uh, was very much conscious of this. But I think that toward the end of his life, when he was really um, trying to search and find was a way in which to talk about living beings as human beings and using a kind of transcendent approach to um, looking at the, our world and looking at our societies rather than uh, an empirical way of identifying black, white, Latina and so forth. Um, and this is reflected in his second marriage that he married uh, a white woman and he said, as an aside that he was paying homage to his father as much as he did in the first marriage to, he was paying homage to his mother. In other words, he was trying to transcend the, the boundaries that had been set uh, by society on race and gender. So um, Frederick Douglass continued to contribute where it was possible to the suffragist movement. And um, the day that he died, he had just come from giving a speech to a group of women. Um, and that I think signifies his commitment to the movement itself. Thank you. So thank you to our panelists, Meg Mott, Amel Ahmed, and John T. Grayson. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us and for the great questions. Um,